Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our webinar, our Zoom, and celebrate Juneteenth. Thank you for coming. And um, I'll introduce, briefly introduce our panel by having them say hello. We have Father Michael O'Keefe, a vicar for Black Cat. Uh, Very good. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. We have Dr. Allison Medlecci. Hi, Allison. Hey. Um, Kevin Johnson, a musician. Say hi, Kevin. Good morning. Glad to be here. Author Matt Farland out of Charleston. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. And a new addition to the Office of Black Catholics, uh, Michael Gordine. He is the Assistant Director for Black Catholics, and um, he's going to specialize in youth and young adults. Is that right, Michael? Good morning, everyone. Yep. Very good. Okay. Michael, you want to talk about the agenda? Sure. So, um, Today's agenda, we're, um, as you can see, we're gonna open up with um, a prayer from our new Bishop, Bishop Jacques Favre June. And then following that, we'll have some uh, opening remarks as well uh, from Father Michael Okir. And then our music for um, the Juneteenth presentation by Dr. Kevin Johnson. Uh, following this, a history of Juneteenth by Dr. Arthur McFarlane. And after this, a video presentation on um, the beverage sorrel uh, by Dr. Allison Melechi. And then uh, closing remarks from, uh, excuse me, from Bishop Fogg. Okay. And um, Bishop Fogg is not with us right now. When he comes on, we'll bring him in. And hopefully um, I will hear something from him. Okay. So, Father Michael, will you lead us in an opening prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Lord, we thank you for opening our eyes. Opening our eyes to unity. For opening our eyes to diversity. For opening our eyes to inclusion. We may not see them, but they still exist. And these are demands from your relationship, Trinitarian relationship, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This appeal is also part of what we celebrate in the Eucharist. This appeal is what we celebrate as children of God. We thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to responding that you have called us to be individuals with soul and heart and mind. Thank you, Lord. As we celebrate June 10th, we ask that the whole world will come to see the importance of diversity, the importance of unity, the importance of inclusion, so that we can remove the fear that make us to divide among ourselves, the fears that will make us to subjugate each other or one another, the fears that will make us to be angry and annoyed and not willing to change and to accept one another. We thank you, Lord. No matter how long it will take, may it remain in our minds that you have created us equally as human beings, equal, equals, as brothers and sisters. May we grow in the church. May we grow in our communities. May we grow in our families. And we reach our full potential as human beings taken into the, taken to the image of our maker. We make our prayers through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to change our agenda a bit. Um, zoom in on the budget and gets here. 
Um, let's start with some music. Kevin, you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let um I'm gonna let um, Michael introduce you and all of your fabulous work that you do. Okay. Yes. Um. Well. Uh. <laughs> again, we have uh, Dr. Kevin Johnson, and um. Really, I want to just uh, emphasize the, you know, we we can read the the accomplishments and and everything, but. Um, I want to thank you personally for, for bringing the music and um, because you can't have a celebration without music. And, um, and as a musician myself, I, I understand the importance of uh, really setting, setting a mood and bringing um, joy to people in, in this way. So thank you for being here. And I look forward to your presentation. All right, so why don't we, can, can everybody hear me enough? We can hear you. Okay, let's uh, begin with uh, our national anthem. No better way, more no more appropriate way to begin with uh, our celebration. We'll, can you hear the piano? Okay, so yes. we'll begin. A solo by the way <laughs> oh, I, can, I can see some of you whether you're singing or not
so glad to be with you. My sound is acting up a little bit. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to share my presentation today. I understand I have 15 minutes. That was three of them. I uh, saw your mouths moving. Especially you, Arthur. Thank you. You were getting it. You should have had your microphone on, man. <laughs> I uh, wanted to share today's presentation with two people who um, I remember as a kid growing up in the Catholic Church who had an uh, extreme impact on me. And so the first, without further ado, and I'll probably go ahead and be playing somewhat in the background as the first video plays. Um, I don't probably need to introduce her. Um, this is Sister Thea. Now I'll come back around to, uh, let's see, make sure I got the right one here. I share. Yeah. What does it mean to be black and Catholics? Catholic, it means that I come to my church fully functioning. That doesn't frighten you, do, does it? I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as gift to the church. I bring a spirituality that our black American bishops told us, they just told us what everybody who knew knew, that spirituality is contemplative and biblical and holistic, bringing to religion a totality of mind and imagination, of memory, of feeling and passion and emotion and intensity, a faith that is embodied incarnate praise a spirituality that knows how to find joy even in the time of sorrow, that steps out on faith, that leans on the Lord, a spirituality that is communal, that tries to walk and talk and work and pray and play together, even with the bishop. You know, when our bishop is around, we want to be where we can find them, where we can reach out and touch them, where we can talk to them. Don't be too busy, y'all. A spirituality that in the middle of your mass or in the middle of your sermon just might have to shout out and say, Amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. A faith that attempts to be spirit-filled. The old lady said, if you love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your whole mind and all your strength, then you praise the Lord with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength and you don't bring him any feeble service. If you get enough fully functioning black church Catholics in your diocese, they gonna hold up the priest and they gonna hold up the bishop. Lord. We love our bishops, y'all. We love y'all, too. But see, these bishops are our own, ordained for the church universal, ordained for the service of God's people. But they ours. We raised them. They came for our community. And in a unique way, they can speak for us and to us. And that's what the church is talking about, indigenous leadership. The leaders are supposed to look like their folks. Ain't that what the church said? <laughs> to be class, black and Catholic means to realize that the work of the ordained ministers is not a threat to me, and I'm no threat to that. The work of the ordained minister, of the professional minister, is to enable the people of God to do the work of the church to feed us sacramentally, to enable us to preach and to teach. And I ain't necessarily talking about preaching in the pulpit. You know as well as I do that some of the best preaching does not go on in the pulpit. But as a Catholic Christian, 
I have a responsibility to preach and to teach, to worship and to praise. Black folk can't just come in the church and depend on the priest and say, let father do it. And if father don't do right, then they walk out and they complain, you know, that liturgy didn't do anything for me. The question that we raise is, what did you do for the liturgy? And the church is calling us to be participatory and to be involved. The church is calling us to feed and to clothe and to shelter and to teach and your job to enable me, to enable God's people, black people, white people, brown people, all the people to do the work of the church in the modern world. say that Leon that's the great Leon Roberts um, I wanted to point out well I ran across that video of Sister Thea and uh, I just been in my own ministry um, thinking about um, you know I grew up with that um, idea the Vatican II offered us to work worship in our native genius and I've just been doing a lot, a lot of thinking lately about, you know, uh, what does it mean to me now? What does it mean to our church now? What does it mean to worship now? What does it mean to black Catholics now? What do black Catholics bring now? What do we, what does it mean to be black and Catholic now? I got my dashiki on. I like to wear this on the Zoom calls. If y'all who were here last year, don't be hating talking about it. He wore that last year. I like I like wearing this when we get together for dinner. But that being said, I've been spending I've spent the last four and a half years uh, as a music minister uh, singing in uh, majority Catholic church. Somebody's mic is on, but other than mine, I'm not sure whose it is. Um, and I've been singing, you know, I've been singing a lot of this. Take our breath, we ask you, take our heart, we love you, take our lives, oh Father, we are yours, we are yours, yours as we stand at the table, you said, yours as we eat, and this is this music I remember from when I was a young seminarian, when I was a young kid going to Transfiguration Elementary School, it didn't, it wasn't soulful, but now I'm singing it in my white church now, and I can't help but sing it with soul. I mean, I can't sing it. I can't sing it plain. But I, we are yours. We are yours. If I let's say, mm. but I'm singing it. One thing I say, I never, I never have tried to be black because I just always been black, and I, I never try to be, you know try to do things like a black person in the Catholic Church because I've just always been black and I've always been Catholic. So that's just, you know, who I am. Uh, nowadays, as I experience being a music minister in the white church, I bring all that. And I remember, and I listened to Thea, that's why I played that video, talking about how black, what the, the gift of our community to the church. And I think it has everything to do with the universality of our gift that our music is universal. It reaches a lot of people. And I know, you know, people come up to me at this church and they oh, I'm just crying. I get it, I get it. you know. Black folks, we might be more apt to start shouting or something, or, you know. I guess maybe some white folks shout, but a lot of them just cry and they come up and just, oh. And I say, well, you know, that's what black people have offered to our church, ability to connect in a spiritual way and I think that even though you know I'm not even sure what it meant I know back in the day it meant put on your dashiki dance you know the preacher's gonna preach in a black style you know you're in a black church I'm not really sure if that 
you know, is what we're doing anymore. But we certainly, as I said earlier, I'm still black and I'm still Catholic. And I just think for today's church, with the, as we see our numbers diminishing somewhat in various communities, I talked to a brother of mine in Los Angeles. He said, man, you could take these congregations from St. Bridget's Holy Name, Chance Fig, and all, fit them all in one church. Uh, that's sort of where our the numbers of black people have diminished. But, you know, having said that, I say, you know, I'm getting ready to embark on helping uh, Father Yuri Mark at the Lighthouse. Um, I'll be working with the college students. Um, and there's not a lot of Catholics, but I remember back in the day at Holy Name, when, when we were shown up having church in the 80s, People were coming from the AME churches. I mean, this black people coming from everywhere to worship with us. Sort of, that's a gift. And I, that they, I believe now, since I've been um, at a non-black church, it's the same thing. Today's, you know, we celebrate Juneteenth as, you know, the celebration of our freedom. And I say, we still, we bring our freedom of uh, worship to our church, un to the church universal. And as I engage the Lighthouse with Father Mark in the upcoming semester and years, that I want to uh, bring that same freedom of worship style of cultural worship in my native vineyards to our church and, and give it to these young people. I wanna share with you a video of a thing I did last semester with our young people, which I got from Nina Simone. I don't know if any of y'all seen Summer of Soul Quest Love's film. Um, I, I, I saw Nina doing it and I said, I gotta do this with the young people. I know they don't get some of the phrases that we were saying in the 70s, like that's where it's at, you know, and all that kind of thing. But I said, I gotta do this. Um, and we did it for graduation this year. And I, I thought, let me share this with you in terms of uh, just opening up a little bit what I'm doing with the young people. Let's skip a little bit of the beginning. to what I 
My message today is not where it was, it's where it is. It's as my folks say, it's where TI is. It's where it is. Where is what? Where is this gift of African American music to be found in our church today? Where where can we engage these the youth? Like I was engaged as a kid. Um you know, with Leon Roberts and the whole uh, Rejoice Conference and people like Sister Thea Bowman. And I remember because, you know, I was part of the early guitar musicians uh, in the late 60s. But by the time 70s rolled around and uh, we were uh, saying it loud and we was black and we were proud and I learned how to play the piano and brought gospel music in the holy name of Jesus Catholic Church, where I um, always have to mention Richard Cherie. He hired me as a kid for that job. And I, I stayed there 20 years and developed the ministry there. Somebody kicking a mic. Hold on, I got you, Kathleen. Who is that with this mic? OK, somebody don't realize their mic is on. Because I think they're catching the Holy Ghost. They're doing a ring shout, and I just hear those feet. I don't, I don't know if they're catching the Holy Ghost. And so anyway, you know, as, especially when uh, the twin, one of the twins passed, and I thought, you know, Kathleen, you share? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Kathleen, you share that. That's back. That is not where you it's at. That's where it was. <laughs> that's, that's back when I was a little younger. Um, uh, yeah. So, you know, it's all about evangelization for me and finding ways to reach the young people. And especially reaching the old people, too, because, you know, some people stopped going to church in the pandemic. And some people are just really loving this thing. They can watch church online, you know. We just got to get back together. We got to get back together somehow. Um, and it's not just for black people, but I do believe that our gift of music and of worship and of praise is a gift to the universal church. So that being said, um, I'd like to, uh, I think I'm right. I got this maybe a little, uh, a little more time. I wanted to share this time, not only with Sister Thea, but I wanted to share it with Leon Roberts, who started at Howard University in 1968, got his bachelor's degree in music ed, and uh, did liturgical, he got a liturgical studies certificate. But all that, you know, being said, he was one of the founding members of the Howard University Gospel Choir, and uh, did a lot of work with the Young Adult Choir and with the, uh, Library of Congress Gospel Choir. But in 1977, he was invited to come to the struggling Gospel Choir, help them at St. Paul and St. Augustine Catholic Church in DC. He embraced that opportunity and was uh, a Catholic musician from 1977 to 1994. He was director of liturgical music at St. Augustine in uh, D.C. and elementary school. He directed uh, many different workshops, but the thing I remember the most about Leon as a kid in music was the Rejoice Conference on Black Catholic Liturgy. 
um, it might have been 1989, uh, Free Church Conference was held in Rome, um, but it was certainly the development of African American liturgical music since Vatican II, and um, he was part, a uh, big part in the creation of the Lead Me, Guide Me hymnal. So um, as I give up the podium on this beautiful Juneteenth 2022, I want us all to realize it's not about where it was, but it's about where it's at and how the beauty of being black and Catholic is a true gift to this universal church. And maybe some of us who find ourselves in mixed race churches or you know, I don't think anymore so much about the way in which we worship. I think it's about the way in which we reach all people through this gift of soul that we've been given. So as I close, I want us all to take a minute. And if you don't know this tune, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and project it so that you can see the text and join Leon Roberts and myself in our Juneteenth celebration as I close with this is the day that the Lord has made, let us be glad and let us rejoice in it. So I'm gonna share this screen and play it. Kathleen, thank you for inviting me back again. Hopefully, you know, I was, I know I was good last time, but <laughs> hopefully I was just as good, <laughs> just as oh, good. Oh, Kevin, you're always good. You bring the joy with the music. <laughs> All right, Kathleen, you sweetie pie. So here we go. I'm gonna share this and let us just use Join with Leon Roberts in the celebration of this Juneteenth.
Amen. Y'all be blessed. You too, Kevin. Thank you. We are energetic now. Good morning. Good morning, Bishop Fox. Okay, you have to unmute. True. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? We're good. We're good. Glad to have you with us. Indeed. Glad to be here. Well, um, we're going to let Father Michael O'Care introduce you to everyone. And then um, you can talk to us. How about that? Kathleen, can you please send down the script of, um, so that people can share with me? Sure. Good morning, Bishop. I have the pleasure to see you virtually. And uh, Father Michael O'Kerry, I'm at St. Martin the Poorest Catholic Church in Columbia, South Carolina. I am still waiting for an opportune time to come and say hello and share with you. We do. And uh, in the parish and also in the ethnic Black Catholic ministry. I was so joyful to be at the ordination of uh, Bishop Favre. I was uh, really delighted, delighted. Um, as we all know, um, the Bishop has come from a long history of mission, especially coming from all across America, west to the southeast. Uh, Bishop Favre um, was previously the administrator of San Felipe, the Jesus Mission in Forest Park, Georgia, and the local superior of the Scalabrian priest in Atlanta. He was ordained on May 13th, 2022 and elevated to the Bishop of Charleston. Um, a long history of movement. Bishop came from originally from Haiti, uh, lived in New York and worked in the Midwest, was ordained by the Cardinal of Washington, uh, our own Cardinal. And Bishop is here today. A little history about Haiti and the Diocese of Charleston. Bishop, uh, uh, it's important that we share this information that 202 years ago, uh, uh, when Bishop England came to the United States from Cork County in Ireland, uh, he also was in charge of a church in Haiti. 202 years later, a bishop has come from Haiti to become the Bishop of Charleston Diocese. It's so significant, and uh, it goes a long way to tell a lot the work of mission, how the teacher has taught and the student has learned. Welcome to our midst, and we hope to hear and see more of you, Bishop Jacques Favre. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Michael, and I'm looking forward to see you also. And uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Kathleen. Yes. The bishop is um, a little frozen there. I am. Um... Okay, he's back. So it's my turn to talk? Yes. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Good morning to all. Good morning, I bishop. We have um, a large number. I think we have 78. That's, uh, that's a good... Uh, you know, the power of um, technology that we can be uh, together this morning and uh, sharing, uh, you know, our experience. As uh, Father Michael was saying, I was born in Haiti. Uh, I left Haiti at the age of uh, 16. My mother came first to the States uh, as a migrant, as an immigrant, and then we followed uh, the, the rest of the family. We are all together six children and both of my parents passed away and uh, we hope that they are in heaven with the Lord and looking down upon them, upon us this morning and sharing that beautiful moment. Uh, it, definitely when we speak about uh, 
being Catholic and black uh, coming from Haiti, it's a different, totally different experience uh, from those who are who were born in this country as black people and being part of, uh, of that long tradition to be Catholic. I just wanted to, uh, to start with the definition of slavery. Is the state of being owned by another person being in bondage? So that's what, um, when they asked me to write a message for the diocese, uh, the word was, uh, I added, uh, officially, uh, slavery was ended, officially. Uh, because it's, uh, we have still have modern slavery, uh, which is the severe exploitation of other people for personal or commercial gain. Modern slavery is all around us, but often just out of sight. People can become entrapped, making our clothes, serving our food, picking our crops, working in factories, or working in houses as cooks, cleaners, or nannies, and so many other uh, work that people do, instead of being uh, an experience of freedom, they become slave of a company or a person. So when we're talking about freedom, being uh, free from slavery, we have to remember there are other ways or we can even enslave ourselves. So what is freedom? Freedom is the power or right to act, speak or think as one wants without hindrance or, which, or, or restraint. So, uh, it's, it's kind of awkward for, for us, at least from Haiti, to hear that uh, we are celebrating Juneteenth as a day of freedom. Uh, let's look at some uh, facts in history. Uh, as you know, Haiti was the first black independent country to be liberated in 1804. Then we had uh, Serbia in 1804 to 1813. The United Kingdom, uh, 18, uh, 30, uh, 30, uh, 1833. So we have uh, a America, as we know that Abraham Lincoln uh, with uh, the promulgation in, in 1930, 30, uh, 1933, I'm sorry, 18, uh, 30, 30, 30, I mean, 63, 1863, and uh, June, uh, on the 19th of June, uh, the federal troops had to go to uh, Galveston, Texas, to free the rest of the, of the slaves. So we could see how many years from 1804 to 1866. Um, Brazil is the last country to free their slaves in 1888. So from um, as, as a country, uh, uh, we might say uh, either in Haiti where we don't have, you know, whites as we do here in the States, we still have systematic racism, inequality and uh, inhumanity. As uh, last year, uh, President Biden called it the original sin of the United States. But there's also, he said, there's capacity to hear, to hope, and to emerge from darkness. From darkness to light with a specific purpose and, and resolve action to, to remember that Genesis first, God created us, all of us, so that we can uh, dominate the world. We can dominate everything that is created not allow things to, uh, to dominate us. And, uh, and, and, and we hope and we have to work that everybody can share in the goodness of God, in the goodness or the bounty of, uh, of creation. So uh, we have to look around. And I, I really believe that if one thing that we can do to better the lives of others is to 
help with education. Uh, I've been doing a, a lot of a lot of uh, graduations in the, the month of May here in Charleston, and I went to a lot of, of our Catholic schools, and we can see there's a lack of presence of good uh, education for our black uh, brothers and sisters. So we're not saying that uh, they cannot find it in, in, in public school or other, of other school, but if we, are, if we are Catholic and we, uh, we have a school that is teaching the faith, why not open it to those uh, brothers and sisters that are in need? So if we don't work on education, it's gonna be uh, repeating uh, the grudges, repeating history, and we're not making any dent in uh, trying to better the situation. So as I've said, uh, I was born a, a Catholic. My parents, are, you know, we both were Catholics. Uh, or I have to say my, my father is, is converted from a Seventh-day Adventist to Catholicism. But as a family, always go to church and always share the faith uh, with a, our brothers and sisters were all Haitians. So there was not uh, that uh, angle of putting color with, with the faith as I discovered here when I come to the States. So we talk about black uh, Catholics, white Catholics, and we don't talk about uh, Catholics or Christians as a whole. Although that uh, uh, Bishop Tutu that I will quote at the end said that we uh, we, we have different perspective of the same God from, from the perspective of, of, of a black person and from perspective of a white person. But I think, you know, if we emphasize uh, a lot the color, so I wonder when we become Christian, period. So we are children of God uh, with different, different colors, different experience, different places, different languages, but we are all children of God. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that if I recognize that I have a father, I recognize that I have a creator, I recognize uh, he, he's the only father and we are all brothers and sisters. So the way that I will treat my sister, uh, my blood sister, my blood brother, that's what a God is expecting from me and that's the way we're supposed to treat one another. Uh, so that it doesn't matter if I have my brothers, you know, some of some of us are light skin, some of them are dark skin, but we we are all brothers. Uh, we have different personalities, so I think that's that's uh, you know thinking about this day. I know that uh, you know we can we can uh, emphasize on that on the history and all uh, continue to look a space in this big country. Uh, this. Uh, this country with so many possibilities, and we have uh, some of our brothers and sisters who are unable to uh, to enjoy. I, uh, Father Michael is is from Africa, and I'm from Haiti, and others. So if we come to this country and we can find a place, uh, it's because of our education. It's what what who we are as, as persons. So. Uh, and if a person was born here uh, because he's black and he's unable to go to school, unable to live in a, in a fairly good neighborhood, so there's something wrong that, that with, with, with the country that we, that we have to, uh, to continue to push that every citizen in this country will have the same right and same possibilities. We are all limited in terms of, of uh, some of us can learn, uh, can study, can have degrees, and others not. They can, other can are unable to do to do it physically or psychologically or intellectually. However, that doesn't mean that the person has to be excluded with some so many possibilities. So that's um, that's what I would like to emphasize and 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 share uh, that personal experience of faith. Uh, since I was a child, I would uh, go to go, go to church every Sunday. I don't remember how many times I've missed. I missed a Sunday mass. Uh, I don't remember when I I did not participate actively in my community. 
And that's the thing that we have to, to help uh, the young people that have been preaching in every confirmation that to get young people involved in our churches, uh, give them participation. And I, I question, and we know why we don't have a lot of black Catholics because they were unable to be part of, of the church. That's why they, most of them were able to bring, to create their own church because that's uh, because of, of uh, the inability or the lack of openness of the doors to let uh, the black uh, Americans be part of, of our church. So that's evangelization have to take, uh, to take uh, into account also this reality. Uh, if we have something good, we have, good, we have good news, so why not share it with, with others? We're not saying that ours is the best uh, as religion, but if I have something I believe and I think it's good for me, why not share it and, and reach out to our brothers and sisters uh, a black and we can see. Uh, I remember one day I was talking to a black a man a, when I was in Guantanamo, he was, he was in the military and he asked me, I don't understand how, how can you be black and be Catholic? <laughs> because this is a white church. So I had to, to explain to him that I did not have that experience. I was Catholic because it's, that's what I, I was raised uh, to know. So uh, I will leave it at, uh, as that with that, uh, then maybe later on there will be some inter interchange questions and so on, and we can do that. I, I was, uh, you know, when, once I read that book, Hope and Suffering by uh, Bishop uh, Desmond Tutu, and I just uh, on page 140, I think that will be a good summary. So what we are celebrating today uh, and also, I, would be, I was at Mother Emmanuel on Friday, and I heard someone say that uh, we should not have two uh, a national national hymn. So it seems that there is that debate. You know, our uh, our uh, uh, blacks belong to this country or does do not belong to this country? Is it two country or one? So there are a lot of things that probably we can go into and miss the point of, of uh, freedom, freedom, because the, no human person has the right to put another human person uh, into bondage. So freedom, it's, uh, and we, it's rooted in Christ, it's rooted in the Bible uh, to be free, not only as a race, but as a person, to feel that I am loved, to feel that I can share my, my, my uh, gifts uh, with others and, uh, Others have dignity, and I have dignity, so we have to respect one other, uh, one another's dignity. So uh, Bishop Tutu expressed it that way. Uh, with that, I will conclude. You know something? We are each a temple, a tabernacle, a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit, of Jesus, of, of God. Yes, you are God carrier. God dwells in you. He dwells in me. That is why it is such a blasphemy for God's children to be treated as if they were things uprooted from their homes or dumped in arid resettlement camps. Jesus says that to do something to those he called the least of his brethren, brethren he is to do it unto him. My value is intrinsic, intrinsic. That is, it is constitutive of me as a human being created in the image of God. I am God's viceroy on earth. You are God's viceroy. If only we could believe this, this of ourselves, then we would be, behave so differently to our usual conduct. Those who are victims of injustice and oppression would not have to suffer from a slave mentality by which they despised themselves and went about ap apologizing for the existence. They would know that the matter, the matter to God and nothing anybody did to them could change that fundamental fact about themselves. And those who are privileged would realize that they matter too. They have an intrinsic, intrinsic and in, in, uh, 
a learnable value and so don't need to amass material possessions. So as if to say, that is what I am worth. That is who I am. Nor would they have to behave like a bully. His behavior is really a cry for help, for recognition. They would uh, then have to stop throwing their weight around. God, please help us to know that we matter, that we are creatures of your love from all eternity. For you, you choose us in Christ even before the foundation of the world. What bliss, what, what ecstasy, if we really could believe that the world would be, would be a different world. So let us conclude with uh, the prayer that makes us one family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Um, Kathleen? Yes. I want to say thank you for making this giant stride to bring the bishop uh, in our midst today. Uh, we are joyful to be Catholics. And we are joyful to be African-Americans and Africans and Blacks from all uh, parts of the world. Um, I strongly believe um, and agree that we are all children of God equally. Um, this, this avenue, this moment, give us avenue to celebrate our uniqueness, which uh, has come from struggles and uh, from historical um, um, givings in, a, in, in, in the world. Uh, we have, when I came to America, I thought about it. I didn't know that there was gonna be this division, like blacks and whites. I didn't know that there could be a place where most blacks will become comfortable, or where they would not be where they would be uncomfortable to worship. So, but then um, after long studies of history, I kind of applaud the blacks who still remain Catholics and who still find moments to show their faith. And then we find out that. Um, they come with a great history of culture, very great a history of faith, a great history of family system that can inform the present American Christianity and Catholicism. I have been opportune to have uh, friends from other parts of, our, of the nations who came from Africa, Grenada, Haiti, and how the system has glued, the, the family system has been informed and, and, and grown through Christian faith, especially the Catholic faith. And um, that's the reason why we think, even the African-Americans who helped preserve the Christian faith for us, how Christianity has uh, helped them to withstand uh, the, you know, those difficulties they, they encountered when they came. And uh, so we, we in, our, in most of the churches that gravitate towards black culture, black faith, black history, they seem to find God because God is found in struggle in, in finding the ways to, to make sure we tell the world who we are. And thank you for agreeing to continue to keep our schools open because education most of us who started well, we started with Catholic education that informed us and started to teach us the faith from an onstart of our lives. Education is an important thing. So thank you for the work you're going to do in advance. Um, you, we, you have a great predecessor who loved us and worked with us and supported us. You, had a, you have a great predecessor who piloted the affairs of this diocese with love and kindness. And uh, we welcome you in a special way. We have not had the opportunity. 
Um, uh, this is not a forum to, you know, give you what Kathleen, Kathleen does or what I do or what we do in this ministry, but I want to tell you that um, we want to welcome you. We are so happy uh, to get somebody who believes in inclusion and um, diversity and uh, works of the Holy Spirit. Any way we can be of help to continue to evangelize our people because of the disproportionate uh, uh, level of numbers of people we find in the church. We want more blacks to be to participate, and to know that Catholicism is not things that a thing that is exclusive. It's something that is inclusive, and to uh, understand that we are all welcome in the table of God's love. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Michael. Yes, thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Kathleen. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll continue our program. And the bishop will be with us for a while. So at some point, we can open it up to the audience and you all can comment and may ask any questions if you have some. Okay, we have a poll question. We're gonna, uh, you all know how to do polls. You'll get to answer it online using your buttons. I think most of you all know how to do that. Okay, here's the question. This president played an important role in ending slavery. Was it George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, or none of the above? Okay, go ahead. Let's see what you know about Juneteenth. And for the panelists, you won't be able to participate for some reason, Zoom is not set up to where the panelists can um, participate in the polls. Okay. All right, we've got 54% participation. Well, go on up, put your answers in and we'll cut it off in just a minute. Okay. We're at 70%. We'll go ahead and see how you all did. You all did very good. 98% said Abraham Lincoln and 2% said none of the above. And um, this is really good. Now you know it is Abraham Lincoln. That is the correct answer. And I think that um, it's enlightening that we have someone that is here wanting to learn about What's going on with Juneteenth and that history? I hope that we get more people to engage in this. And I think it's so important that children learn this. And Michael, Michael shared something with me. I'd asked him, I said, Michael, when did you first hear about Juneteenth? Michael, tell him what you told me. Right. So this was about a little over 10 years ago um, when I was in uh around middle school um, and uh, I learned about it through through St. Anthony's of, of Padua and um, through our pastor at the time, uh, Father Patrick. And um, it was uh, something that was never brought up in, in my school, at least, um, you know, going to, to a public school and um, yeah, learning about it, celebrating it and observing it has since then just become a, a, a part of a part of my year, um, even, you know, before it was nationally recognized, at least um, it's been uh, something that that has been um, uh, a part of my celebrations. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And our Catholic schools are teaching diversity, equity and inclusion to our students. And a part of that is about that history. Black history is American history. And we're having that opportunity to learn more about it and include it in our studies. And that way we are preparing our children for a diverse world. They're gonna be leaders one day and we are giving them all that they need to lead well. Amen. Okay, speaking of history, we have the Honorable Arthur C. McFarlane on, and he is our historian for the Office of Black Catholics. He is so rich 
and knowledge as far as what our history is on so many different topics. So this is gonna be a special treat. Um, judge Arthur C. McFarland served as the municipal court judge for the city of Charleston for 33 years and serves as the city's chief judge for 28 years. A native of Charleston, he began his career as an Earl Warren Fellow with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York. Judge McFarland was among nine Black students who desegregated Bishop England High School in 1964. And by the way, I pulled this from Bishop England School's webpage because he was their speaker for their commencement. And um, they did a great job. And I recommend you going to the school's webpage because they have pictures of Arthur when he was a student there and they tracked him through the years and, and show some of his accomplishments as well as those pictures. And I thought that was pretty cool. And um, Bishop England is um, a very well-known uh, Catholic high school in Charleston. And it's a beautiful high school. I love driving by it and looking at it. And I've been there to meetings. So I highly recommend checking some time. And um, he received his uh, doctorate, Juris Doctorate from the University of Virginia Law School and was admitted to practice law in South Carolina and the federal and United States Supreme Courts. Arthur is also past Supreme Knight of the Knights of Peter Claver. We have any Claverites out there? Here's a little shout out. <laughs> okay. Um, and a member of the Board of Advisors for the Diocese of Charleston Office of Black Catholics. Um, he helps us a lot uh, with his knowledge and his guidance and expertise in the field of Black Catholics. Arthur, you want to share some knowledge with us? <laughs> Well, Kathleen, it's um, certainly good to be with my uh, brothers and sisters again once more, but particularly with the addition this year of uh, Bishop Jock Spar June. Um, I must say that this is the fourth occasion that I've been in his presence in the last five weeks since his ordination, including his ordination. And I must say that, um, you know, we, Kevin talked about um, the in cultural, our cultural roots in Catholicism, and certainly uh, Bishop Fobb has not, um, uh, at least, uh, failed to include his cultural roots whenever he's, he's gotten an opportunity to speak. And so I just want to, again, say to him that uh, we, uh, welcome him uh, to the diocese, and as he did uh, yesterday at the um, uh, the Feast of Corpus Christi in his homily, he preached a message of unity, and that's on each occasion, including today, he's brought that message. So I, I certainly thank him um, for that message for those of us in the diocese. He's already given some history of uh, Juneteenth, and um, certainly as a part of what I would add to what he's already said, I want to give a shout out to uh, Opal Lee who has, uh, we, owe, we are in a, owe a debt of gratitude to her for having marched um, certainly from Texas to Washington to ultimately um, cause the Congress and the president to make uh, Juneteenth the uh, national holiday uh, that it is and that we're celebrating uh, for the uh, second year. You know, one of the things Kathleen had on the screen just now the order that was issued by uh, General Granger, um, which notified the hundreds of thousands of uh, enslaved folk in Galveston that they were now free. But in addition to uh, the line that uh, was shown on the screen, there is another line that I want to share because I think it's important for us to know what our ancestors were told um, by General Granger. And I quote the, uh, the last part of his uh, proclamation, and it says, this involves absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of employer and hired laborer, close quote. So, you know, in June 19th, 1865, it was 
clearly reason for celebration of this announcement and why not? Uh, come on, you gotta imagine that what it must have felt to uh, by our ancestors to suddenly being told that not only were they free, but they were also equal in status to their informa enslavers. And so, you know, this is after living as property of another man and all of the, with all of the brutality and the, the mental and physical brutality that accompanied those conditions. You know, jubilation is certainly an understatement in describing what they must have felt on that day. But what did freedom mean? Bishop has referenced freedom. What property rights did they have? Um, they didn't own the land they worked or the contracts for services that they provided um, through the enslavers uh, with their customers. And so on this day, what was going to happen to them? What would they do? What did it mean to be newly freed and to told now that you were in a relationship of employer and employee? There was no, certainly there was not a union. Um, but this change was instant. Who was negotiating for wages with the new employers? What did the Freedmen's Bureau do to assist these hundreds of thousands who are now free? You know, citizenship did not come for the newly freed African Americans really until six months when the, with the passage of the 13th Amendment, uh, which officially ended slavery in the remaining four states of the Confederacy. And what did the 13th Amendment say? It was very short. Uh, it said, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, you know, because this was a legislation through the Congress, somebody decided to negotiate that exception language. Somebody knew that if they criminalized the conduct of the newly freed slaves, they could continue slavery by another name. Um, you know, during the civil rights movement in, in Charleston, uh, as a teenager, I would attend the rallies before marches, et cetera. And there was a gentleman whose name was Charles Mason. Some of those in Charleston may know Mr. Mason because he was a principal in the uh, fielding uh, home for funerals here. Mr. Mason was a big man. I guess he, he at least he looked to me to be about six, uh, six feet five uh, inches. Um, and at each of the community meetings, he would begin his solicitation or financial investment in the movement by saying, y'all, freedom ain't free. Freedom ain't free. And as I grow, I've grown older, I realized he was so right. The bishop has said that he's from Haiti, who declared its independence from France in 1804. But in order to keep its freedom, France required Haitians to pay reparations to the former enslavers of the Haitian people. They set a debt in the 1800s of 150 million francs to be paid by the Haitian people in installments in order to avoid being obliterated, basically, or returned to slavery uh, by the French. Haiti became the first and the only country where the descendants of enslaved people paid the families of their former masters for generations. So what, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they were not the only descendants of the formerly enslaved to pay families of their former enslavers. You know, the 15 words that I just mentioned in the 13th Amendment um, uh, came, uh, was added so that there could be reparations continuing for the uh, former enslavers. Um, those 15 words really meant that freedom for us as African Americans would not be free. So let me give you a list of examples quite quickly um, as you ponder this idea of freedom. And the bishop um, certainly also mentioned freedom in his presentation. 
Uh, first of all, think about the black codes which imprisoned black men for minor crimes right after uh, 1865 that sentenced them to hard labor, free labor uh, for their former enslavers. Now that's, that's continuing reparations for the enslaver. Think about the 15th Amendment, which ensured the right to vote for black men then taken away during the post-reconstruction disenfranchisement and continues until today through the passage of voter suppression laws, intimidation of election workers, and of course, former President Donald Trump's big lie. Also think about the system of Jim Crow and legal segregation that was instituted by the Supreme Court in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Think about the lynchings that occurred in the late 19th and early 20th century. Think about the land that was promised, the 40 acres and a mule. Uh, some land was given, but it, ultimately most of it has been taken away. Think about the Tulsa massacre and the loss of Black Wall Street, as well as other riots by white citizens to deprive African Americans of the wealth they were trying to uh, generate. Just think about the wealth that has not been transferred from one generation to another because of the discrimination that we have faced. Certainly we've got, we can't not, not think about mass incarceration where longer sentences were and are still meted out for blacks than for whites committing the same crime. And I urge you once again to, real, to read Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow, which outlines how mass incarceration has just robbed African-Americans of certain rights and privileges in this country. Think about the inability to transfer wealth because of simply because of employment discrimination. We couldn't get certain jobs until after the Civil Rights Act of um, 1968 uh, was passed. Um, redlining, where we couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. Um, banks would not lend us money to even repair the, the homes in the neighborhoods where we live. Cannot not think about today's gentrification that still robs Black people of their property and resigns us to um, find housing in a market that um, certainly is an unaffordable for many of us. And police brutality, which followed the end of legal segregation, that whole Black code things, put police and law enforcement in place to make sure that African-American men were arrested for minor crimes, taken to jail, and overseen as they labored daily um, to, to, to earn income for their former masters. You know, we live in a state where Black children continue to be under undereducated in our Black schools. Um, black kids are three or more times likely to be suspended and expelled. Um, and you know what? Our prison planners, it's been known for decades that they look at the number of Black fourth graders in our public schools in order to determine the number of prison beds they will need in the future. And that's not, you know, hyperbole. That is, an, that is a fact, and it's been reinforced uh, certainly lately. So we've got to be on the lookout for laws that are designed um, and, and budgets that are designed to create prisons because they have a formula that certainly is used in order to um, ensure that our, the incarceration of black men that started in 1867 continues on until today. Oh yeah, we continue to pay a price for the freedom that we thought started in 1865 for all of us. And as Mr. Mason said in those pleas for financial support during the civil rights movement, y'all, freedom ain't free. So what does that mean for us today in the second national holiday commemorating Juneteenth? Simply put, the struggle continues. Freedom is the hallmark of this democratic system with certain rights enshrined in our constitution. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and the right to petition our government. Now we may not face the same legal racial segregation 
but racism is alive and well. Issues of gender inequality, LGBTQ plus status, ethnic discrimination, white supremacist terrorism, environmental injustice, gentrification, and so many social justice issues we must confront. But you know that that is only the beginning for us because it is wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves, whether, as I said to uh, the kids the other day, whether we find ourselves in the rectory or the governor's man mansion on Wall Street or King Street or Main Street, we have got to confront racism because that is the only way what happened in 1865 will finally be realized by all of us because as we have said time and time again, none of us, none of us is free until all of us are free. And so I will reserve the balance of my time so that you know, we can hear from members of the audience and what they think about Juneteenth, what they think about the struggle, what they think about where we need to go in order to be equal, both in the Catholic Church as well in the, in, 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 in the, in the larger community. So thank you all and thank you, Kathleen, for this opportunity. Um, thank you. Thank you, Arthur, um, for being with us and sharing that. I did attend um, my parish, St. Anthony's of Padua in Greenville's Juneteenth celebration yesterday. And I think Deborah Drennan is out there. She shared it in the chat about um, the Juneteenth celebration. The speaker was Zeke Zimmerman from Orangeburg, and, and he said basically some of the same things that Arthur was saying in regards to Juneteenth celebration. Well, celebration means you're jumping up for joy and having a good time. However, our reality is when the slaves were free, were they really free? If they were free, then why were the Jim Crow laws? Housing discrimination. And it goes back to the theory of systemic racism, how it's so deeply embedded. And we have to continue to confront these things as they come along and not be afraid to voice our opinion. So again, um, you look at it as a baseball team and this is what the speaker said yesterday. A baseball team may win one game. Do they celebrate? Well, the real celebration should happen after they win the championship, which will consist of more than one game. So we can look at ourselves as being in that championship and trying to win the championship. Amen? Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Catherine. Yes. Uh, maybe it would have been better to call it rem Remembrance Day instead of celebration. Uh, a celebration is to remember. So when we remember, it can we look backward and we look forward. Uh, I like that. Still, uh, need to do instead of maybe That's what we're gonna do next year. We're gonna change the name. We're gonna call it Juneteenth Remembrance Day. How about that? Sounds good. You like that, Michael? Michael's gone. Well, we're going to move along because we want to um, give you all an opportunity to um, make some comments. And we have one more presentation. Um, before that, this is going to open the presentation. I'm going to quickly give you all another question to participate in. And we're going to see what you know here. Let me bring it up. This is on traditions, Juneteenth tradition. And the question is, the color of soda pop has become closely associated with Juneteenth celebrations. Is it brown? Is it green? Is it red? Or is it purple and red? Trick question. Okay. You all are fast. Okay, come on. Just give it your best shot. Okay, we got 40%. Let's go ahead on. It's 
65. Okay, one more second, and then we're going to cut it off. Go ahead. Okay, we're about at 70%. We're going to end the poll, and let me show you all the answers here. Interesting, huh? Um, we've got 16% um, said brown, 9% said green, 57% said red, and 18% said purple and red. Let's see, Father Michael, what's the answer? Father Michael? Okay. Got, yes. Um... I think it is red. You are correct, Father. It is red. Okay, it's red, folks. So again, another little Juneteenth fact. And we're going to go deeper into that color red with our next speaker, who is Dr. Allison Malechi. And um, Allison is going to demonstrate a Juneteenth drink from her country of Trinidad and Tobago. And this is a tradition uh, with a plant that comes from Africa. And she's gonna tell you all about that, the hibiscus. And I took my little tea out this morning. I was gonna make it, but I didn't have time. And um, this is a plant that uh, comes from Africa and has a lot of good things about it. It reduces blood pressure and it cools your body, okay? So, Dr. Malechi. All right, thank you and good morning, everybody. So um, those of you who know me know that I've presented before, but what you may not know is for me, I love to cook. Cooking is my special kind of decompressor, creative outlet. So when Kathleen asked me to do something, I thought I would share with you part of my culture. And the reason why I chose this particular um, drink is because it does have African roots. So it comes originally from the continent of Africa, like okra, like rice. It was brought over by the enslaved. Um, but it also is not just particular to folks in, in the Caribbean, it's also um, important to folks in many places of Latin, many parts of Latin America. So it's called sorrel. Catherine, can we go to the next slide? Yes. Okay, I see the little twirly thing. Ooh, um, mm -hmm. and so, so it's, it's something that is um, very important to us, especially around Christmas time, which is when we tend to share it. Um, unlike, we don't have Juneteenth, right? I mean, even in the US, Juneteenth is, an, is a new holiday. Um, but where I come from is Trinidad and Tobago, and it's the first place to have a holiday to celebrate emancipation. We used to have this thing called Discovery Day. Columbus discovered, you know, blah, 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 right? We, we threw that out many, many years ago, and now we have um, Emancipation Day. So this drink that is sometimes called hibiscus, you know, it's known around the world by these different names. Can we go to the next one? Y'all can read, so I'm not gonna read to you, right? Um, and like I said, typically we serve it around Christmas drink. Now, you can grow this plant in South Carolina, I discovered a few years ago. So let's get to making the drink. Next one, Kathleen. I recorded this just for y'all. So, oh yeah, I forgot about these. This is what it looks like on the tree. This is me having harvested it along with some butternut squash. And this last picture here was me last year when I went to Greece for the very first time. I saw it dried, like how you would dry raisins or apricots, and they were um, selling it in the farmer's market there. Okay, next one. All right, Kathleen, hit play. Let's see. 
Hi everyone, this is Allison McClatchy and I am here to show you how to make what in the Caribbean, or I should say in my part of the Caribbean, is called sorrel, otherwise known as Heimica, otherwise known as hibiscus. So what I have laid out here are the different forms of sorrel. Okay, so you see in the bag, that sorrel that I actually grew two years ago, and I cleaned and de-seeded, and I put it in the freezer. So if you look, you can still see the ice crystals on it, okay? Then there is the sorrel that you can get dried. Typically in a Hispanic store is where I get it from, in a Hispanic grocery store. Um, like I said, I think for folks from Latin America or Hispanic speaking, Spanish speaking countries, it would be called Jaimaica. If you go to a Mexican restaurant, that's what you're asking for to drink. Um, and then you can get hibiscus or sorrel tea, tea bags in a regular grocery store, right? So this is just one brand of it. Any of those things can be used to make the drink, okay? Um, here are some things that I was taught that you put into the drink when you make it. So we have your clove, we have your bay leaf. Okay, so this is, we're not putting the, the whole orange, we're just using the orange peel, okay? Um, just about any Caribbean household I know would have orange peel, which they just keep the you know when you when you take the orange when you're going to use the orange you take the peel off and you keep it in a cupboard you let it dry out we use it for a number of things but we use it especially in when we're doing our drinks and for some of our cakes when we make it and ginger okay so if you are from jamaica or if you have been to jamaica you would get sorrel but very often there is this very heaven, heavy um, presence of ginger in it. My part of the Caribbean, we put ginger, but we don't put as much ginger as um, they do in Jamaica. So these are the basic things that you need to make your sorrel. So I'm gonna show you how to make sorrel using my frozen, organically grown, um sorrel that i like i said i grew it and um you know i have had it in the freezer for about two years now so i'm gonna show you how to make it using that so here we go right i've added the aromatics and i'm gonna add some water maybe about i would say four cups of water and then I'm going to let it boil for about 20 minutes. Well, not really boil, but more simmer for 20 minutes, 30 minutes maybe. And then I'm going to let it steep. And typically, according to my older sister at least, you gotta leave it for at least um, 24 hours, right? 12 hours will do. If you're in a hurry, it really doesn't matter. It's up to you. But of course, the longer you let it steep, hopefully the more flavor you get out of it. Okay, everybody, it's been a little bit more than 24 hours. And so after I boiled it, it has been sitting, steeping like this. Okay, and now we're going to go to the next part, which is actually making the drink. So I have in here about a cup and a half of sugar. It seems like a lot, but sorrel is extremely acidic, okay? Um, which is why for some people, using the tea bags are easier than making it from scratch. I also have here cheesecloth and I have my seed. So what I'm going to do is actually boil some water and mix the water, the hot water with the sugar, 
because I found that this is the best way. It's like making sweet tea, traditional sweet tea in the South, using um, hot sugary syrup really enhances it. So I'm gonna boil it, add it to the sugar, dissolve the sugar, and then I'm going to pour the boiled sorrel through the cheesecloth. And you don't have to use a cheesecloth. I do because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's petals, it's a flower. So, you know, there's gonna be some debris that's there. And so that's what I'm gonna do. And then I'm gonna show you in a little while what that looks like. Okay, so I have put this through the sieve and the cheesecloth, and that's what I end up with in terms of debris. But this is what my drink looks like. Okay, and here it is. Okay, so I have put this through the sieve and the cheesecloth, and that's what I end up with in terms of debris. But this is what my drink looks like. Okay, and here it is in my cup. All right, so that's my sorrel. So what I want to show you as well is a couple of ways that people serve this. So if you like it the Jamaican way, here is some homemade ginger beer, which is non-alcoholic, of course. And yes, I make my own. And it is very, very spicy. And it's a great way to dilute sorrel, to dilute lots of different drinks. And so you can have it like that. If you are festive, here is some sparkling wine. Try having it like that. The way we have it at home, most people just put some white rum in it. And, um, you know, if you ever get invited to a West Indian's home, always kind of verify if, especially if you don't drink alcohol, whether or not the sorrel already has alcohol. Lots of people just make an assumption and they add it. Or you can go fancy, but still non-alcoholic and just add some bubbling, bubbly water to it, okay? Or you can do what I love best, which is just to drink it straight, because I just love the taste of sorrel. One other thing that I'd add is even though where I come from, we don't celebrate Juneteenth. Juneteenth is a very American holiday. We probably, you'd probably get sorrel served to you Christmas time, New Year's Day, um, throughout the Christmas season, because the plant tends to be harvested around then, but um, just for any kind of festive occasion. So for my sister, for example, who loves the idea of um, celebrating herself and she absolutely loves sorrel. She cannot have a birthday party, which happens to be on the 4th of July without having sorrel. So just a little bit of my own culture. And I hope um, that this drink, um, that you try it. Like I said, if you go to a Jamaican store, you can find it, a Jamaican restaurant. But definitely if you go to many Hispanic, restaurants and you see anything that says hi Micah, try it there as well. So hope you enjoyed that. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Malechi, or we can call her Allison. Um, that's a good recipe for a red drink. And um, of course, you know, here in America, we Americans, we don't take time out to make a drink that, you know, is going to take a couple of days to make that kind of thing. But what we will do is take your drink and bottle it and market it and make a lot of money off of it. Is that right? Well, you know, lots of people make money off of lots of stuff, but I, I do think that people take time, maybe not for sorrow, but certainly, um, you know, I think people will take time to make stuff. How long does it take to, to, to barbecue, right? Good barbecue is over many days so yeah, yeah. You're right you're right um and then you know the japanese they made tea in fact i went to a tea party where the tea was being made 
And it was a couple of hours and sometimes even longer um, to make the perfect tea, which they do. And um, it's interesting. Bishop, do you have a special red drink from Haiti? Are you still with us? Well, if he comes back on, we'll bring him back. Okay, we have another poll question, but I'm going to skip this one. Um, I'm going to check to see if the bishop is still on. He is. Very good. He might be on the phone or something. We can get him to unmute later. He has to do the closing prayer. And then um, after that, we can open it up for your questions. I'm coming up with the Office of Ethnic, Ethnic Ministries, but the Office um, for Native American Ministries, we're going to celebrate the feast day of St. Catherine Tekawitha on Thursday, July 14th, which is her feast day from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And the Native Americans are going to talk about the event with the American Indians and the boarding school experience so that you get a better understanding of what is going on. There is going to be a document released from the USCCB, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So when that document comes out, you will be able to better understand. And it is a calling for better understanding of the need for truth, reconciliation, and forgiveness with what happened there. So hopefully you all will be able to attend. As you see this little barcode at the bottom, if you have a cell phone nearby, you can just take a picture of that little barcode and it will let you register um, right then and there on the spot. And this will also be available on our calendar of events on the diocesan website on the front page. All of our events are listed there. So check that each month. Each month we do have something going on. We will do first Friday table talk in July. However, we will do it the second Friday because the first Friday is that big holiday weekend, the 4th of July. And I didn't want to interfere with people's plans. Okay. Now we'll have some closing remarks and our prayer by Bishop Fogg. And then following that, if you stay on, we can entertain some questions from the audience. How about that? Bishop Fogg, are you still there to close us out? Yes, I am. Okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for this gracious moment that we had together. We're able to share to learn and to project. May your seven gifts of your Holy Spirit be our guide, our hope. And as we have one father in our tradition, we have one mother. And let us say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your own Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and our day of death. Amen. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. So, if anyone would like to ask a question, raise your hand, and Michael and I will um, unmute you, and you can make a comment or a question. Okay, just raise your hand. Okay, we have one hand up, Michael. Let's see. Do you see it, Michael? Uh, one second, I'm searching. Oh, Father Michael has his hand up. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, a lot of people are coming in and going out. Do you have any way to record who who is participating from parishes where they are coming in from? 
Yes. Are you okay? Oh, um, not the parishes, but we have their email and their names. Okay, it's good to know so that we can follow up later well, on. Well, I can, I, I can see some people out there and I know where they're coming from. We've got uh, Deacon Larry Deshane, um, and Deacon Larry, you want to say something? Thank you for being with us too. Um, Father Henry Kula. Thank you, Father Kula. And um, Father uh, Kula is from Charleston. We also have um, St. Patrick's is represented, Paul Stoney. I see a hand up from Eleanor C. Nelson. Okay. You want to unmute her? Uh huh. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Hi. Eleanor. Hi. Good afternoon. Oh, still good morning. Good morning. Um, I didn't realize my hand was up, but um, since I have the opportunity, I just want to say thank you so very much for the opportunity this morning. Um, very informative very, very helpful. And I've taken some notes so I can pass some information on and do, do some more studying myself. I um, had heard of Juneteenth years ago, but didn't quite know what it meant until a few years later. And so I, um, I appreciate the information, especially from um, uh, Knight McFarland. He's always uh, a wealth of knowledge. But thank you again for the uh, opportunity. And welcome, Bishop Farber, to um, Charleston, South Carolina. Thank you. Okay. Um, Julia had her hand up, and, and it's not up anymore. Let's see here. We have I see Norma, Davis. Norma Davis. Yep. And before they go, Kathleen, there are so many questions, some two questions out here by De Deidre Davis and okay. by Can Charles you, Eric. You want to read them, Father? One Can is you Willard. hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, I don't know. I might have been muted. <laughs> we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Good. Yes, What's your I, name? It, Norma Davis from okay. St. Patrick's in Charleston. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the program this morning. Thank you so much. And I want to recommend a book I'm just about finished with on Juneteenth by Annette Gordon Reed. It's not long, it's an easy read, but very, very informative. So for anybody who wants to expand your knowledge on Juneteenth, which I needed to do. Um, I recommend the On Juneteenth by Annette Gordon Reed. She won a Pulitzer Prize and is a historian from Texas. And it's very, very interesting. Thank you so much for this wonderful program. Oh, thank you, Norma. Father, you wanna uh, the first question here is, uh, will a bishop visit local parishes around Charleston in the foreseeable future? That's number one. Number two is, how can the conversation continue among black and white on these issues? How can we begin to build relationships among and between parishes? That's from Charles Eric. Yes, my plan is to visit all the parishes, not only once, maybe two, uh, two or three times if God's willing. Thank you. Very good. Um, in continuing the dialogue um, on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have been doing that for about 10 years. And we do offer opportunities for you to dialogue. Either we can do them in your parish, you could just call the Office of Black Catholics. And um, also, we will post dates for where we can have some virtual ones. It's easier for people to participate across the state and not have to worry about driving and um, to a location. And we will have some in particular locations as well. So um, those dialogues are ongoing. Again, Kathleen, um, like we've, we have mentioned before, um, 
that's a lot of uh, lack of knowledge or uh, not depth, lack of depth in this area that we're talking about. So conversation and dialogue is important, especially to use the diocese and tools to reach parishes that have lacked information about these discussions and these dialogues. Um, you know, it's not resistance as much as it is uh, dearth of information. And so, so we lack participation. Uh, uh, the discussion is, is going to be more beneficial when it becomes uh, diocesan wide or uh, giving people information that they need to participate in, not allowing them to choose which dialogues to follow. Dialogues of, of inclusion is very important. It's not about um, isolated moments so that we can have all parishes participating in the sense of uh, something like Juneteenth, which has been declared a, a, a public holiday, is not mentioned in some parishes, in, even though they may not have a great number of black people in their churches. So information and education, they go hand in hand. So this is a forum. This is just but one forum. We need to create greater forum to get uh, people, especially coming from southern, south southern of, of this United States, we where most of the actions took place, especially the coming of the African Americans came through Savannah, through Charleston, and just the southern south of uh, of the United States. So we really need to be champions. Every parish in the diocese must be able to tell a little story and not just from a ethnic black ministry, but from uh, a, broad, a broad section of our diocese. So discussion, as I, if I would understand that question well, would not just be among ourselves. <laughs> discussion is, can the diocese become more involved, even if it is not evangelization sake, but for knowing sake, I think that's what we really need to um, explore how this can, you know, go. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, we have it, Tom Orth. You can yes. unmute and talk. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks again, Kathleen, for uh, all of your hard work and your your many ethnic ministry uh, programs. And today was. Uh, especially uh, wonderful. Um, and uh, yesterday, Bishop Fav was uh, phenomenal at the cathedral. And uh, uh, we thank you, uh, the, the procession, the Corpus Christi procession through downtown Charleston was phenomenal. And uh, uh, if anybody has ever a chance to go hear the Bishop preach, uh, I encourage you, uh, uh, the homily was terrific, but uh, I just wanna say that going forward, in my opinion, it's important for white Americans uh, to get involved with Juneteenth uh, celebrations to ensure that the holiday, uh, the original intention is, is carried on, uh, namely the celebration of freedom and um, as Arthur said, um, you know, we uh, uh, know that that in, in one sense ended uh, slavery, but it, it, it went on after that. And, and you know, we continue to, to carry on the um, uh, cause for uh, uh, systemic racism uh, to, to end in the United States. And, um, so I just I just think it's important for all of us white Americans to really get behind Juneteenth. So thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Okay, we have Elise with her hand up, and also um, Allison Malechi. Elise. Good morning. Uh, someone asked about continuing the conversations on racism and systemic racism and the importance of Juneteenth. I coordinate, I, I, I chair the Committee on Racism for the Knights of Peter Claver on a national level. And we um, 
I coordinate webinars every year uh, for this organization. Will, uh, Brother McFarland has been one of our um, panelists. Very willing to coordinate a webinar, a national webinar to, to discuss systemic racism in any form that anyone is interested in us delving into. The more we we've had the discussion on racism in the Catholic Church, you know, we're brave. We don't mind going ahead and at the subject. We had this discussion on racism in America, systemic obstacles. And we need more discussion. I have another um, webinar that will be planned for November. But whenever you want to hear or we want to have a national discussion on racism, let me know. The Knights of Peter Claver is always willing to step up and organize a webinar and a discussion on this very important subject. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Allison? Yeah, so um, I want to take a few minutes to say something because I heard what I was listening closely to what the bishop was saying, to what Father said, you know, to everybody so far. And I really want to disagree with a lot of what was said. Okay, again, you all know me, I come from a different place. Um, but I don't think this diocese has done enough to confront issues of racism, right? I don't think it is a matter of the people just need the information. I think that there are lots of people who are fixed and stubborn and do not want to see others as their brothers and sisters in Christ. I think there are a lot of folks who want to imagine or continue to hold on to the illusion that the Catholic church is a white church. And that's just not statistically true, okay? Um, and people, will, people have the information. They choose not to engage with the information, okay? I know that Kathleen has been running these programs for, I don't know, however many years now, right? And every time I come, I can see the same people in the audience, right? But the people it needs to reach, right? The folks who are in the pulpit, you know, Kevin did this wonderful thing with the music this morning. I have seen that. I have seen that. I have seen when, when the ladies from Catholic Hill came to St. Peter's and they were the choir for St. Peter's. This little white woman walked up to the priest afterwards and whispered, can we have them every Sunday? Because the Holy, when the Holy Spirit takes hold of you, it don't matter what color you are. Right. And one of the ways that we enter the liturgy is in music and in movement. And I come from a place where I think maybe if I'm being generous, 5% of the population identifies as white. Do you know who has one of the hugest charismatic movements? White folk white Catholic, it ain't got- oh, yeah, those white folks do good. Okay, but what I see in this diocese is this failure for many of our white brothers and sisters to engage with non-white people. They wanna make us into them, okay? Rather than being open to the experiences to let everyone come together the all of me all of me right that's what i want to bring right the all of me and you know i paid i i pay attention to this partially because of what i do for a living okay you cannot tell me 
that even though in our hymnals, there are quote unquote, black spirituals, that you as a parish never play one, never play one for the entire liturgical year, except one on Good Friday, right? Where's the inclusion in that? Well, you know, we have the Lead Me, Guide Me hymnal and- um, It's not even, I, I, Kathleen, it's not even in, because I, I go to St. Peter's, so it's not even Lead Me. In the hymnal we use in St. Peter's, there is Lift Every Voice in Sound. I have never heard it sung. Okay. Never, ever, ever. Right? And so that's what I'm saying, right? So, yeah, and you all know I do this every time, every time Kathleen invites me. This is my soapbox. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to embarrass you yet again, Kathleen. Well, no, um, we need to hear things like but that. that, that I, just... I, it is not about lack of information. It is about lack of commitment. And yeah, I'm going to mute myself. Uh, yeah, we need, it's a lot of work that we, we need to do. And um, Allison, you're very helpful in helping us to do that. So we can sit down at the table and come up with some ideas of how to address these things um, in a way to bring people to the table. Arthur has his hand up, and so does Father Michael. I think, Father Michael, you want to, you were first, so I'll let you. No, I have a question here. Yeah, the question is, my question is for Michael Godin. I'm curious as to what some of your ideas are for ministry to young people. Michael, did you hear that? I did. And um, really, actually what uh, Dr. Malachi was just saying in terms of uh, playing, even just starting with music in the church that comes from, uh, you know, our Black American heritage and our music, I think that music and movement that, um, that she was speaking on, um, it really speaks to everyone, but in particular, uh, particularly the youth and people my age. And, um, and I really think that ministering to them has to start well, maybe doesn't have to, but in, in my in my view of things, I think it's a good place to start with um, with music, arts, and culture that uh, you know give you know give the praise and glory really um, uh, because it's uh, what I hear a lot of times from from people my age is uh, how they'll be basically bored by, um, by uh, uh, really just um, re religious activity. And, um, and I think, you know, I think that by bringing in music that is engaging, it would help open up uh, the beauty and in the liturgy uh, to to make it to make it known that it's all connected and uh, universal. Um, and so, so I really think I really think uh, ministering to the youth should start with um, start with showing what what. Catholic arts and um, and and culture has to offer to uh, to their um, spirituality. So that's my ideas on it. Well, the second part of my my lifting up my hand, my my raising my hand is to tell Doctor McClesche that we have to be patient. Zeal is important, but we have to also know that. The Black African Americans, whether they are coming from Africa or who live here, are mostly minorities in the parishes where you find them. 
they are not just, they don't constitute a great number. So it's also very important to recognize uh, that it is our effort to go to most of the parishes, make our points and our appeals reach the pastors. And um, they, don't, they don't know these things we share here. Maybe to send it to them, to share with them and uh, tell them how, why it is important to be inclusive because it falls back into that story of inclusion and unity. Uh, so not that they don't know, but we really need to be a constant reminder uh, 